if you're going to play in that retail space and being, which really is about engaging consumers at the end of the day, you know, you almost have to become the best marketer there is. I'm Dave Mergel with Aquacraft Brand Portfolio and Aquacraft Seafood Innovation. And this is where we talk to thought leaders around the seafood sector and influencers around the world, all with the idea that we're going to use brand marketing to engage the consumer and try and grow seafood consumption here in North America. And for today, I wanted to switch things up a little bit and get in the mind of a real major seafood buyer here in North America. Someone with massive retail buying experience, someone who's worked for some of the biggest seafood organizations in North America, including America's probably the largest uh, seafood retailer in America, and really get inside his head and understand his motivations, what he was thinking about coming out of the pandemic and how he was going to make his decisions, what he thought the role of marketing is coming out of the pandemic and what the responsibility of marketing is on the producer. So he had a lot of great insights. In fact, he had one really interesting thing that I never thought about, and that was the nuance of how our sector is heavily influenced by imported seafood and the role that that plays on the role of marketing here in the seafood sector. So a lot of great insights, really great conversation with Matthew Davis, currently with Shamrock Foods, previously with Santa Monica Seafood and Costco, among others. I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Hello, Matthew. Welcome. We're here today with Matthew Davis. Matthew is a veteran and an expert uh, seafood buyer, has been in the seafood sector as a major buyer with major organizations, both in the trade, uh, as well as some of the major retailers around the United States, including uh, the biggest retailer in the United States, if I can say that. So Matthew, welcome. Really excited to get your insights on the seafood sector and trends coming out of uh, the pandemic. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dave. I, I'm happy to be here and excited to, to talk about it. There's a lot of good opportunity coming out of the pandemic, and I think a, a really unique opportunity to get retail or, or retail consumers to try more seafood and to diversify their portfolio. So, well, and the and the pandemic was, I mean, it was crazy for almost every sector in the world, and the seafood sector was no different. But on the flip side, on the retail side, we saw an incredible boom. And seafood was no different than any other food product. It absolutely uh, saw multi-year highs, maybe historical highs in terms of consumption and seafood movement at the retail environment. So what do you see coming out of this pandemic? Is that uh, a short-term trend or will that continue? You know, I think that that'll continue. The, the seafood consumption spiked by happenstance of the other proteins not being able to supply. You know, the, the beef packers and the, the poultry packers had some supply gaps and seafood was the only protein to fill. And when people were pantry loading and, and panic buying in the, the beginning of the pandemic, they were buying protein, whatever they could get their hands on. And a lot of that translated to seafood. Uh, so, you know, it, once it's in their freezer, they got to figure out what to do with it, right? So there's, there was a lot of uh, first-time consumption and, and first-time consumption of, of new types of seafood uh, that I think will continue. You know, I, when you look at some of the marketing data that I've seen, uh, the number two item that, pe that consumers look forward to consuming in restaurants as things reopen is seafood, right after steak, obviously. But, um, you know, see, so People, are, people tried it during the pandemic, people who wouldn't normally try it because, again, they had no other opportunity. And then there's that pent-up demand in, in the, the food service trade for seafood cooked in, in you know, ways that you can't really do at home. I, I think that we're, we're on track to see seafood consumption in the United States uh, increase for the first time in 70 years. So it's great. I'm, I'm that excited. is exciting. And that is exciting. Yeah, that is very exciting. And you're right, there was a lot of trial. And, and I think hopefully consumers, as you say, got past their apprehension of what do I do with seafood? How do I prepare it? You know, there's this sort of unknown uh, how to do that. 
And if it translates into more consumption, I assume that that'll benefit all channels of trade. And of course, another trend during the pandemic was just this massive increase in e-commerce. I mean, it was growing uh, prior to the pandemic, of course, but then you saw this absolute explosion, natural for natural reasons. What do you think of the role of e-commerce now that consumers have had that experience? Was Again, was it a short-term experience due to the pandemic, or do you think now that's going to become a new way of life? I, I'm of the opinion that that's a new way of life. Um, it gives, you know, if you look at some of the programs and, and subscription boxes and things like that, um, the ones that are variety are giving uh, consumers and new venues to try things because they're providing recipes, they're providing side dishes and, and all of those accompaniments uh, that they're taking that hard work or, or that, that guesswork off the table for the, the home consumer. And they're doing it in, in ways that don't make it cost prohibitive. So I think as people get back to the, the hustle and bustle of everyday life, going to the office, going to the gym, et cetera, um, that convenience is going to stick. And, and so I, I definitely see that being a, a, a net benefit to seafood consumption um, because of the subscription box model of, of including a seafood item in, in the majority of, of their offerings, but also the excitement and the, the trial that it builds into anyone who picks up one of these boxes for the first time, whether it was during the pandemic or outside of it. So so let's switch gears for a little bit and uh, just kind of get into the mind of the seafood buyer and really start to, I, I'm really interested in your motivations and how you, how you uh, make decisions. How much will you be thinking about that sort of traditional role and how much will you be thinking about selection and um, interesting, unique attributes and, and really the value side of it? Like, or do you think it'll really more or less still be about uh, the fundamentals. You know, as we've come out of the pandemic and, and move forward, um, I, I really think that those, those who offer seafood and set themselves apart with specific products that have definable quality attributes, that customers can go to a, you know, a restaurant, order it by name, uh, and, and have that universal high quality experience no matter where they are in, in the, the U.S. or in the world at large, um, I really see that as the future of seafood and, and how we can grow the business. Um, anybody can sell you a salmon fillet, and it can be from any one of a dozen countries, and your experience can go from great to that's terrible. Um, if you order salmon and your experience is that's terrible, you're going to blame the fish. Uh, whereas if you go to a restaurant and buy a steak and it's terrible, you blame the cook. Um, so that's the that's kind of the mentality that uh, the, the, the different mentality that seafood has versus the other proteins, and why uh, I think the programs that that do set standards, have quality attributes, consistency of quality, um, are are really where the growth and the the opportunities are going to be as we move out of COVID. In the pandemic, producers everywhere really had to up their games. And, and even separate from the seafood sector, I mean, consumers are sitting around, they're doing tons of research. Yep. They were becoming way more concerned with health. They were, you know, maybe even growing this interest towards sustainability. They want to know who is producing the food, the products, which all of those things really line up nicely with a seafood producer. But so do you think now that the producer has... Uh, a responsibility to up their game in terms of sort of meeting all those expectations of the consumer or, or do you think again, it's really going to be about back to, you know, good quality product at the right price. I, I think that the producer has a responsibility both to the, the consumer and the, their, their shareholders or their stakeholders uh, to, to move away from, from that commodity. Um, you know, the one thing that the pandemic taught the seafood industry, I think finally after, you know, 50, 60 years, is that commodity 
sales are a race to the bottom. Uh, so the, the really they have a responsibility, and I think that they're seeing that the, the pandemic showed them that um, that to get away from the race to the bottom, which always happens, uh, no matter what what sector of seafood you're looking at, um, is is to brand and define the quality attributes around their product to take it out of that commodity market. And so who do you think is going to be taking lead on on marketing and really telling the story uh, coming out of this? Is it is it the distributor? Is it the end customer? Like it, is it the retailer and or the and or the restaurant? Is it the uh, is it the producer? Like, who do you sort of see taking lead? I think it starts with the producer. Uh, the the producers that uh, get some some marketing behind their product, put some effort and some money into it to tell their story. Um, they get a much better result. So uh, you know, at at the end of the chain, where you have that consumer who's you know now tied to their phone. We all have one. Um, you know, and, and can hit that QR code or pull up that link to the, the, the YouTube video of the farm or their story, et cetera. Um, you know, that, that it, it all starts with the producer. And, and I think that the producers that get behind their own programs are going to be the most successful uh, with the end consumer and the retail, um, because then they're the, the owners of their own destiny and they're not beholden to a distributor or an importer, et cetera. Well, I think that's really interesting, that perspective, because, and I, you know, I completely agree, actually. But, but I think that, you know, there's been a, a few good examples of producers that have done an excellent job of marketing, and really that's about so many things. But generally, this, what I sort of see is the producers in general um, – really haven't done that at all. And they haven't um, committed the resources and the investment. That's what I'm curious about is what, uh, what will it take to get these producers to, you know, really to embrace new sophisticated market strategies and be aggressive coming out of this. Yeah. I, I think that to address part of that, you have a culture gap because seafood is a global product. Uh, if you compare it to beef or pork or chicken, you know, those are domestic for the most part or, or you know, Canada, Mexico, USA. Um, but there is a culture gap that, uh, n- that needs education outside of, of the, the North American continent for those producers uh, on, on how to market successfully to the American and Canadian and, and uh, Mexican consumer. Um, once that education occurs and they see the value, I, I see them investing. If you look at some of the success stories, you know, the Verlassos, the, the uh, Schooner Bays, um, those producers took it upon themselves to not only create a, a build a better mousetrap, create a, a, a premium quality product, but to understand how to market to um, the, the American consumer in a, in a way that they'll respond to. But actually, that's a really good point because, okay, so let's connect the dots here. So the U.S. really is the most advanced marketing society, you know, or culture that there is. Every other category, you've got this real advanced branded, uh, you know, developed category. And now seafood is, is really not at that level, but also most seafood in the United States, you know, not all, of course, but a, a, an enormous amount of the seafood that comes in the United States is imported from other countries. So maybe that's one of the challenges that you just identified is the fact that in these other markets, marketing really hasn't, um, you know, dominated the culture. And so maybe there's just this lack of sort of understanding of the American market. Yeah, I, I just, I don't think that they understand the value of it. Um, and that education, if successfully done, like I said, it's going to result in uh, a better quality products for the end consumer. And it's going to result in a, a better uh, bottom line for those producers who, who pour their lives into these products. 
Now, uh, maybe think back in time a little bit, Matthew, when you were uh, a major seafood buyer for one of America's biggest retailers. And think about what your decision making uh, was based around. I'm curious to know what were the major sort of three or four things that, you know, drove your decision making? Yeah, in the broad sense, uh, quality was the first. That quality led before everything else. Uh, and then, then consistency and then price. Um, if I can have the greatest product in the world, but I can't get it into the, the customer's basket, you know, every 10 days when they, they shop, then it doesn't work for me. If, you know, the, the get to the next level, um, you know, if I, if I can't get a, a price point that makes sense, then, you know, obviously that would, that would disqualify it there as well. But uh, quality, price, and service, I think, are, are the, the three keys to retail. Uh, if you want to go after the, the higher end, more educated consumer, then, then that's the way that you want to, that, that's going to be the, the determining factor. The first thing that I always looked at was quality, and not just the quality of the, the product, but the, the quality of the story of the product, the quality of the sustainability certifications, and, and the, all of the, the other attributes that are definable as, as quality points. That's really th those are that that's really to me determined before anything else what we were going to bring in. You know, I'm curious to see does that trend continue? Does frozen continue at the same levels? Does it flatten out? I mean, should should seafood producers be thinking about the frozen world? Because then again, in the retail environment with frozen, you know, you can build a little bit of a greater relationship with the customer than you can on the fresh side. Mm -hmm. The downside to frozen seafood is, is in the packaging. Uh, I'll give you an example. You buy, you go to your, your local grocery store and you buy cod portions, you buy halibut portions and you buy, you know, something else. Uh, let's, you, you take them out of the free, the, the package, you have one, one night, then you have one, you know, four or five days later, now, now you've got two white fish. And if, if you're not, you know, a, a seafood savvy consumer, you've got two white fish. I don't know what I'm, what I'm cooking, right? Cause all you've got is a clear IVP package that doesn't tell you what the product is. It doesn't tell you how to cook it. It doesn't tell you any of those. So I, I see, you know, the quality attributes in frozen are in the packaging as much as they are in the product themselves. Now, um, I remember once talking to one of your colleagues at that same retailer, and he's, you know, I mean, he's more, more or less a giant in this business. Uh, and one thing he said to me was, you know, we can, we can do all sorts of um, agreements with your product, you know. Um, and if you want to put a brand in front of my customers, that will cost you a little bit more, mm -hmm. which I found interesting because if you think about it, um, so what he was more or less saying was that my, uh, stores give you as a brand, a massive opportunity to engage the consumer. You know, I almost wonder that if you're going to play in that retail space and being, which really is about engaging consumers at the end of the day, you know, you almost have to become the best marketer there is, you know, because, and, and again, I'll give you the same example. I, you know, once had a more or less uh, niche or boutique product. We had a listing with that retailer. It really didn't do any, anything. And so the fact that it was simply listed there really, uh, all that did was give us availability to start engaging the consumer. But even the forum that this great retailer gave us wasn't enough to build mm -hmm. and, and drive uh, sales velocities. Which again, really leads me to think that it's time for seafood producers to really up their game and embrace, you know, this idea of big time marketing and everything that that means requires and the investment that goes along with it. Oh, totally. I mean, if you look at the frozen section of, of retail for seafood, producers who can get on board with that are going to have success, more successful programs because they'll have that guaranteed brand presence in the store. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll have that guaranteed brand presence in the, um, the circulars and those things, those 
text messages and some of the, the emails and however the format is that that grocer is working through their, their ad, uh, getting their ads out. Uh, and, and again, the ones who can harness that are, are going to be the, the winners of the next round of uh, taking share in the freezer. And the, the dollars up for, for grabs in, in the freezer section of a grocery store are, are just, they're significant. Um, so I definitely hope that the, the producers can jump on that train pretty quick. Interesting. So... You know, as a seafood buyer and, a, you know, obviously significant player in uh, the sector and the value chain, how are you starting to think about positioning yourself coming out of the pandemic to take advantage of, uh, you know, of the next phase of, uh, of the economy? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, the, the seafood market is stabilizing to pre-COVID levels, uh, which you know, I'm probably the only buyer on record who will go at saying that I think that that's a good thing. Uh, so, um, you know, but I, I definitely am positioning myself less in commodity and more in branding. I, I'm looking at those producers that are branding their products, um, that that I can go to the, the customer and, and say, you know, here's your salmon from XYZ. Here's, here's why it's better than, than the retailer or the, the restaurant down the street. Um, and, he, you know, he, here's why it's worth that extra 50 cents a dollar versus the, the you know, the, the grocery store next door that's got the, the commodity product. Um, I'm really looking towards building brands and building uh, brand equity. Uh, on the fresh side, because I see that that's the way to, to ensure success and insulate myself from the race to the bottom. Well, and I think that that's a really uh, hopeful message because that's what we all have to do is we all have to try and grow uh, in whatever we're doing. And certainly the sector we've chosen our jobs to grow it mm -hmm. and deliver more value to everybody back in the value chain, whether it's the end customer, whether it's the consumer, whether it's a retailer, whether it's you, the distributor, or whether it's the producer, if we all uh, take the approach of delivering better value, then I think it just is going to benefit everyone in the supply chain. Matthew, I really want to thank you for your time today. Really enjoyed it. An interesting conversation on how a, a retail seafood buyer thinks. Obviously, you've got years and years of really detailed and in-depth experience in this. Uh, obviously, you're an expert, and uh, it's been really, really uh uh, eye-opening and insightful. So I really want to thank you and uh, appreciate your time today. Yeah, I look forward to, to talking with you more on stuff and thanks for everything. Awesome. Thanks, you bet.